Welcome to Overcome America Hair Loss Summit. I'm Valerie Fuentes, your host, and today I am with Diane Graham. She's the award-winning author of Head On, The Stories of Alopecia. She's an alopecia coach, educator, and advocate. She, has, she was first diagnosed with alopecia areata when she was seven years old. She published Head On, Stories of Alopecia to share stories and photos of people around the world who are living with alopecia in order to provide a broader perspective on the journey of hair loss. Educating communities in order to empower others who have been diagnosed, especially in the beauty and medical industries, is an important part of Deanne's outreach. She's also the host of Alopecia Life Podcast, where she continues to educate and share stories to help others realize that they're not alone. Thank you so much, Deanne, for accepting my invitation. I'm so happy to have you here today. It's awesome to be here, Valerie. Thanks so much for inviting me. Yes. So let's talk about your story because, wow, seven years old. I want to know what it was like for you growing up with alopecia. Yeah, well, my story isn't, I feel like so many of our stories are intertwined and similar, right, regardless of when you get diagnosed. So my diagnosis happened when I was seven, and I this was my second autoimmune disease. I also am a type 1 diabetic, so it living differently and feeling different wasn't uncommon and it became just something on top of something else to handle so um, or feel with however we want to call it and so it was it was difficult i'm not saying it was easy it was but it was just another thing for me and my family you know your family's super involved in what is going on with you especially when there's a medical crisis so definitely it was it was challenging and i think my story like i said is not that much different from anybody else who would be different at the age of seven you know children who didn't understand with teas because they didn't they weren't educated and we didn't talk about it and they're just curious right and, and i don't think that's any different today versus mm -hmm. back then mm -hmm. way long ago <laughs> <laughs> great so what kind of support did you have like how did your family support you on this journey because i know it you know there's a whole family that goes through this it's not mm -hmm. only you yeah so my family i think you do what you do you seek out medical advice and then you listen to them and and whether or not it was great advice was beside the point and of course it starts off with the steroid cream let's try this and then that at, at truly at that point back when i was diagnosed that what was available they weren't really offering anything else and so that's what we did and it didn't work and my hair fell out over a summer between first and second grade and pretty much i was bald um by the time i i would say probably a few months into the school year and so my my parents really did rely on the medical community to guide us they also because i did start a new school you'll hear or you'll read in the book that my story was about, you know, at getting to school and having my teacher wearing a hat and then having my teacher say, oh, you can, you know, feel free to take your hat off and leave it on the hook over there. And I was surprised when she said that. And I thought, oh, this is a really welcoming new school. And immediately when I took it off, she said, oh, oh, no, 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 put that back on. And so, and she immediately left too. She left the room and I was in there with a bunch of new students. And my assumption now is that she probably went back and talked to my mother to find out what was going on with this kid in, in class and why didn't she know about it. So that turned into the next step, which was wearing a wig. And, and that was the natural step, the acceptable thing to do when you were dealing with hair loss back mm -hmm. then. So in, yeah, so that's kind of what, what happened. Right. And so I know now your work is to empower others to mm -hmm. live their life despite their hair loss. So right. how did you take your own power? Because that's actually going to be our, our main conversation today is how do we take our power back? Right. So I believe for everybody, it's very different. Their, their process of where they want to be in life what they want to do, how they want to present themselves to the world is very different from one person to the next. And when I, I actually had regrowth when I was 14. So my hair grew back when I was in junior high, middle school. And it, 
it was kind of eye-opening to see how different people treated you with a full head of hair versus wearing a wig or being bald and whether that was my own observation or or reality who who knows right but at at that point my life changed i was more outgoing i did more sports and i do believe that one of the number one things that you can do when you're diagnosed is not give up on the things that you love and or discover new things that you do love right i hear several clients several people say i i don't swim anymore because i don't i'm so embarrassed and these are little boys you know middle-aged women they're all, all ages of people who say swimming is one of the number one things that they give up and it's something they love and that is my kind of number one thing that i suggest to clients is never give up on something that you love kind of work your way back into it i know it's not easy um, for me, I discovered playing volleyball, I played softball in school, I loved art, and so it was things that you develop as you go along that, that make you more confident also, mm -hmm. and so that is kind of where, where it all begins, and truly empowerment comes from discovering who you are again, and remembering who you were, so that's a big piece of it. Yeah, and now that you said that, I don't know that I that I've shared this in previous interviews, but um, growing up, my dream was to be a broadcaster, and my mm -hmm. idol role model was Oprah, and that's what I wanted to do. And the moment I I stopped, well, when I started losing my hair, that was my first thought. There is no way I can be in television. Nobody's gonna love me. Nobody's gonna like me. Mm -hmm. It's over. And I actually am really sad to say, but also again, I can tell you, you know, here I am, is that I did stop and I let go of that. And I went to school for business, developed my career in HR, became a coach, always with that thing on the side. But, you know, there was always that calling and it wasn't now until now, up until now that I feel the way I feel and, you know, that I'm doing and really working on myself daily that i comfortable doing this. Like even mm -hmm. this would have been absolutely impossible right. on my own 20s. So you couldn't get me on camera. You could not get me on video. Mm -hmm. um, I completely shot off everything, you know, all my dreams because I was losing my hair. So mm -hmm. I totally, I can totally relate to what you just said. And right. now I'm embracing it. And it's so funny because I, you know, now that I think about it, I am actually starting to do all the things that I love very much. Yeah, um, it's not, it's never late. You know, I'm not a teenager in my twenties anymore, but <laughs> you know, I can still, I can still do it and, and I'm doing it right now. So, you know, whatever it is that, that your heart tells you that you want to do, mm -hmm. you should, yeah. continue, like you said, continue to do it um, right. regardless. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no limitation to when you have to embrace it and, and continue living again. And I would say, I would never have said that I wasn't living but when I looked back, there were things that I did not allow myself to do because, or or did it halfway, or whatever we want to say, and and that's what I hear a lot. And truly, it was 30 years before I met one other person who was living with alopecia, and I I think that that's huge too, is finding that support. There's support out there everywhere, and even people getting diagnosed right now feel very alone and that's that's also something that i try to uh, i've committed my life to letting people know oh you are living in kentucky you're living in peru you're living in africa um you're living in a tiny little town in the middle of the country and let's find you support let's figure that out and and that's so important just to have one other person to talk to to go online join a facebook group join, you know, get, get the resources that you need. And if you can find an in-person support group, just go for it when you're ready. And not everybody is ready immediately. Right. And that's so important also to say is that, you know, there are different steps of the journey and we all handle it differently. Mm -hmm. And we, what feels right for you might not feel right for me. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like right now you feel, I mean, you, you're okay going outside with no hair. You don't wear wigs anymore, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I'm at a point right now that I could tell you that I don't know that I will ever feel comfortable not wearing hair. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and, and both are okay. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Choose where your comfort level is and comfort. I mean, at this stage in my life, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to wear sweats outside and I don't even care in Crocs and no hair and no hat <laughs> if that's where I feel comfortable. And, you know, eventually, if that's what people are looking for, to get to a point to take baby steps or bold moves or whatever we want to call them, then, then you know, just do it when you're ready. I, I'm a person that never forces people to do anything when they come to coaching with me. They usually just want to find small solutions to get started. And I, you know, talking to families, like we were talking about before, this is a family Thing. you know your child gets diagnosed and what do you, how are you going to help that your own child either get very comfortable in their community and what does that look like and so helping families to discover what they can do to ease their child into kind of a welcoming community or make the community welcoming <laughs> by educating is really really important and, mm -hmm. and I love doing that yeah. as well so I know that that's part of your mission so what it what are you doing uh, to educate you're going are you reaching out to to doctors and schools like what do you do exactly mm -hmm. yeah I reach out to anybody and everybody I will I will talk to almost anyone you're all eligible show. <laughs> <laughs> yes everybody listening <laughs> and I won't overdo it but I, I feel like for so long, I didn't say anything. I kind of blended in to the woodwork. I, it was important for me to be an observer of life around me to see how people were going to react to me, right? And I don't think, I think that's pretty common with anybody who looks or feels different, mm -hmm. which I guess is probably 100% of the population, really, when you think about it, looking or feeling different. And, and it's important for me to just, talk about it now in a way that's not necessarily about my own experience but about the collective experience that we're having when we're out and about and how um, you know just knowing the language knowing what alopecia areata is and the different variations of it and what you can see and when I talk to medical communities I say this is what your patients are missing this is what they're talking about this is what they're upset about they need to get into an appointment within, you know, ideally it'd be nice if you could get them in within a couple weeks versus a few months because they could be bald, completely bald by the time they make it into you. So it's really important for me to just continue to educate. You know, people in medicine, you can say they know that they're educated, but they, they are only seeing 2% of the population, right, which is relatively small. And you're saying let's go to a dermatologist because two percent of the population is fairly small um and but it is truthfully it's the same number of people who are dealing with psoriasis and psoriasis is constantly on is constantly being talked to, about on dermatology at dermatology convention so you go okay if this is being talked about let's let's also put this on the docket let's talk about this and how we can make the patient experience better mm -hmm. oh my god this is so important, especially because what I experienced myself is that sometimes you go to a doctor and you get a diagnosis and you walk out the door. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what you have. Go figure it out. There is no, these are your resources. This is what you can do. You know, this is a support group, mm -hmm. anything. I feel like you walk out of the office with nothing. You walk out of your office knowing that there is something wrong. And that's mm -hmm. it. So anything that we can do to educate um, educate doctors and doctors' offices, or even the doctor, just the person at the at the desk. Exactly, front this desk, right? Day. Whoever's answering the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. When you're calling for an appointment, it's just it's mm -hmm. so easy. I wish we could walk out with with a book. I don't know something. Mm -hmm. So I so appreciate what you're doing um, as far as raising awareness and. That's also my intention with the summit is to raise awareness because I, number one, I don't think a lot of people know what alopecia is. Mm -hmm. um, so we can start with that, with the education piece. And um, us the, who have alopecia, did, I mean, for years, I had no idea that there was NAF, that there were, mm -hmm. you know, different, different groups, different support groups, uh, even like, 
um, hair uh, replacement options. Like there, there's mm-hmm. so much that you get to do to mm-hmm. bring yourself to a good place that mm-hmm. it's not talked about. Really, mm-hmm. it's legitimately not talked about because it's, it's, we have the stigma that having hair loss or wearing hair, it's not good. So people mm-hmm. don't even talk about it. Mm-hmm. Really sad because it left us feeling that we're alone and we have nothing mm-hmm. and all the way. Right. Right. Yeah. And immediately when you're at a physician or a clinician, you, you really want to know that there are resources. And, and if you can give them something tangible to leave with saying, okay, here is the support group, um, you know, right here in town. And they will know about it if we continue to educate everyone around us when we can just say, yeah, this is a resource. This is, are you interested in wearing a wig? Okay, here are these great ones that I've researched and they have private rooms. I mean, it, it goes down to even the most smallest detail, right? That, that can really help them. And, and they can take it home and think about it. But, you know, you never, I also tell people to never make a decision at the doctor's office that go in knowing who you are, what your limitations and boundaries are, and go, just leave with information. If you don't think you want steroid injections going in don't get steroid injections when you go in just because you feel desperate because you're not going to be seen in three months Um, readily look at those the the side effects and look at what you are looking for and if it's you know if you want complete regrowth and you just want to start going for it then then do that but if you want time to think about it leave think about it and really consider all your options don't ever feel desperate Right. And ultimately, I think it's so important to know that you know what's best for you. You mm-hmm. know what feels good for you. So mm-hmm. make sure that you, all, that you are the one making decisions for your health and your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then, I also know that you uh, had an amazing book, Head On, Head on Stories of Alopecia. Mm-hmm. And I want to know how did this happen? When did you decide to create it? Well, I always thought I wanted to write a book and people tell you, oh, write what you know. And I knew the female experience of losing hair. And so I thought, oh, I'll just interview women and that'll be good. And when I attended my first NAF conference, actually, is when I started to meet people. And that's where I met um, an amazing group, I mean, phenomenal women, but also men. And I was listening to their experience and hearing that it wasn't that different, right? I mean, there was the the idea that men were going to maybe eventually be bald anyway, so they could just accept it easier. And that was not, that's really not true at all. And young boys dealing with hair loss, you know, without eyelashes and eyebrows, it's not the same at all as a man who's losing his hair in his, mm-hmm. you know, 50s, 60s. And so I thought, okay, I need to include men and then the the child experience was also really important and it just kind of became something that it it was perfect timing i had been thinking about it for years talking about it quietly and then when i met all these people i thought well of course they're out there we are here where there's more of, of us out here and i didn't even know and once i met some even more amazing people i thought yeah let's see if they want to tell their stories and I, so I put it together and it really came together very quickly. And I will say, you know, writing a book is not an easy process, but, but it was awesome just all the way around. It was a great, great experience. And yeah, it's really helped a lot of people too, which is important. I think, I think one of the hardest parts of alopecia is to talk about it really Mm -hmm. and to Mm -hmm. find the courage to invite somebody into your world right Mm -hmm. because it's kind of like our own world we don't or it feels like it's different so um yeah i love that and and again to know also i think like what your book provides to to us is to know that we're not alone Mm -hmm. which is huge yeah like to know that we're not different because i felt different i felt like something was wrong with me i didn't think at that particular moment that you know, there are millions of people, millions right. of people uh, going through the same thing. So I always, I always felt alone. And so I think, I think your book just really provides that perspective of, 
you know, there's, there are people that have been there and they made it. <laughs> right, right. And, and the thing about that is, is that our processes were all different, right? And there, there's no one set thing. And I, I used to call stories when they came in the last four lines. That's, I mean, I could have named the book that the last four lines because that was when people figured it out, right? They, they wrote, 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 and they were like, and then X happened and that's why I am where I am or that's when this happened and I'm still working on it. And so it's never like a done deal. You're never just right. done with it, right? I mean, people react from the outside. You're hearing comments, you're experiencing things that, you know, things are saying to your children at school. And, and so you're just, it, it's kind of an ever evolving process. That, that never ends, but getting to a point where you can just be really happy with yourself and excited to to be in the world, looking the way that that you are is is a big deal. So, right, I I could agree that it's definitely a daily practice. I don't think this is something that um, that you let go of. Number mm -hmm. one, because this is one of those things that you have to you have to look at yourself. Right, like you, we get to see ourselves in the mirror every day, and I think that's one of the hardest things about hair loss is that you you have to face it every single day. Mm -hmm. So it's more about like how are you, you know, what kind of thoughts are you having, what relationship you have with yourself. So when you look at yourself, you're not looking at your hair loss, mm -hmm. but you're looking at yourself. Right, right, for sure. Yeah, and so I also know that you have a podcast now, which I think is mm -hmm. so amazing because we really need to spread the word and raise awareness. So mm -hmm. tell me about your podcast. Yeah, so I originally said I would never do a podcast. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to do a podcast. And then I, you know, was given the opportunity to learn firsthand from somebody who is an amazing podcaster, and he. I mean, I went to an in-person live workshop and that made a huge difference for me because I don't think I ever would have done it. But I realized that I could reach people and, it, and I continue to, I interview, it's an interview podcast, so it's not me talking, it's interviews mm -hmm. with people who are living with alopecia and just doing amazing things and want to share their stories with other people. So it's almost, it's an extension of the book really, yeah. but it's an audio version and people can listen to it in the car, when they're gardening, on the run. And I just feel like it's really provided a, a lot of great material for people out there who are just wanting to learn more. And this is for families. I've had teachers um, who've had kids in school and they want to hear about it and learn. And so they're listening in and I'm just really pleased with the outcome. It's been really great. And I so I started it back in September. And so it's only been about five months. And I'm, I'm just excited that it's growing every day. We have an online Facebook group that is growing pretty consistently. We're up almost to 700 people, and that's all organic. Wow. I, mean, I just kind of let it do its thing. And then um, we have a pretty quiet group right now, but you know, the interaction got bigger when we were talking about dating and Valentine's Day. And oh, yeah. That. So, yeah, there's some topics that definitely garner a lot of. Um, a lot more talk for sure and I'm looking mm -hmm. excited I'm, I'm just really excited about it all well thank you for creating that I mm -hmm. I think like anything we can do to to raise awareness like I'm mm -hmm. so so in and yeah. so tell us about your coaching you were sharing you were sharing earlier that you work with families sometimes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I understand that you do one-on-one -on -one as well mm -hmm. for the, 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 the person that's going through that Mm -hmm. um, and I know you have an amazing gift for us. So tell us about your coaching, the gift for mm -hmm. our audience. I want to hear all about it. Yeah. So the different, I, I know you know about coaching. A lot of people are still confused about the idea of coaching, right? They're like, well, I see a therapist and that's good or it didn't work or whatever. And so coaches are out there doing what they do because they are finding People are finding them because they're of a common interest, right? They go, oh, this person gets me. I understand what they're going through. And a lot of what I do is I help people find the answers that they're looking for when they come to me. They don't have enough resources and information out there, even about the condition. So we talk a lot about education. We talk about 
how we can go out in our communities if that's something that we want to do and educate and how we go back to the workplace you know if we want to stop wearing a wig or start wearing a wig and go from that thinning hair to something like that or play in a, on a sports team and I mean it's just so many different things that people are interested in and we go okay let's figure it out together and we'll start with the information piece and then we'll start moving forward and then we can reclaim that power that seems to get lost when we lose our hair right that that power piece where we go I have no control over this what is happening to me and we go okay this is what we have control over this is how I'm going to move forward and let's do it and so so that's a lot of what I do and then I also like you said work with families because that is just a huge, huge piece of it, that helplessness of how you feel as a parent or even a grandparent or how to navigate that process of outside comments and all that stuff that comes in immediately where people are like, oh, you know, maybe you should drink this kale smoothie or maybe you shouldn't, you know, maybe you should get rid of the pets in the house because that's maybe causing your child's hair loss. And so we, it's educating those people too. So it's kind of a it's a big process but it's also a very simple process right i mean just just working together to to go for the common goal and for what works for you as a client yeah i mean so neat that i um i'm going to share a personal moment right now so when i i started the summit um you know beginning of um, late february and I was, I've been working on it since, I don't know, November or something like that, but very, you know, I get involved with my work and that's it. So I didn't really share with my mom until the very end when he was all ready to go. Um, and then I get this text and she said, word for word, this is what she said. She said, oh my God, I have been praying to God that he will take away my hair and give it back to you. But now I understand that God had a plan for you, and this is why it happened. Thank you for changing others' lives. Mm. And it was so beautiful, but at the same time, I'm thinking, oh, my God, my mom has been in pain mm. all these years. Like, I, that never, never occurred, my, like, never crossed my mind that my mom was going through something. Right. And now that I got to talk to her, she said, of course, like, how do, like, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to support you. I didn't know how to mm -hmm. change this. There was no control over, like. I felt so helpless and mm -hmm. honestly, like I, that never, it never crossed my mind because obviously you were going through your own pain. Right. But so I think that, that what you're doing and your work is just, is so needed because it's really the entire family that's going through this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. And so on that note, tell us about the gift because I know you're super generous and you created something for our audience. So yeah. what is that? Well, I'm, I'm giving away um, a digital electronic copy of Head on Stories of Alopecia for the next 72 hours. So starting when you air this, um, the next 72 hours, it'll be free of charge and you can just click on the link and go on over. And um, obviously the print copy way more cool because you get to touch it and look at it but the <laughs> digital copy is great the content is all the same and I just look forward to sharing those stories with everyone and I also always give away complimentary strategy sessions um, the first 25 minutes of coaching is free complimentary and we can kind of just get to know each other and see if we're a good fit and we can help to, you know, help you reach your goals. So that's also, um, you'll have a link for that in the in the notes there. So yeah, you can find me at headonlifecoaching.com and the podcast is there and Alopecia Life, of course. Come on over and subscribe. And if you feel comfortable giving a review, that would be awesome too. Absolutely. So yeah. again, yeah, thank you so much for all your work, everything that you're doing for us. And I just, I hope that we get to cross paths at some point because I love what you're doing. I would love to collaborate and definitely continue that education piece because I think out of everything that you do, because you do a lot, that piece is so important to really create the shift. I know that right now a lot of people are speaking about it. Thank God, finally, mm -hmm. it's happening. People are talking mm -hmm. about this. But we still need that push. So right. um, thank you for bringing that awareness and doing education, just going out of your way to, to raise awareness. 
You're so welcome, and thank you for all you do. And again, for the invitation to be here. Thank you, Valerie. Of course. And you guys, thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next interview.